Hi friends, welcome back to the black screen of doom for part 42 of Horizon Forbidden West with a therapist. I appreciate you taking the time to come hang out. And, uh, sorry, cats. And uh, I'm grateful for your support of this playthrough. I, I am sorry, but not sorry about the uh, cliffhanger from last episode, but coming in hot. So leave a love, leave a thumbs up, leave a comment, follow the links, all that fun stuff. Without further ado, set up this cauldron, eh? Connections in place. Booting up. Beta, Aloy. I am fully installed on this core and ready to connect to the Cauldron Network. It's good to hear your voice. Errant, everyone. Fire your pulses and sound off. I'm at my Cauldron. This thingy, it's blinking. Did I do it right? In position at my cauldron. My pulse generator is blinking also. That means they're working. I'm in position and mine is too. Mine as well. Okay, radio silence until I give the all clear. Signing off. Gaia, let's cage the beast. <laughs> Connecting to the cauldron network now. Elizabeth Sobek, Alpha Prime, activating Omega Clearance. Elizabeth Sobek, Alpha Prime, activating Omega Clearance. Clearance confirmed. Initiating containment sequence. Oh boy. It's cracked. Look. That means machines are on their way. Get ready. Here they come. Waves of enemies. We spotted. He's sending kitties and babes. Oh, oh god, me. he's sending everything. Got the wind, boys. Oh. Stay back. Hephaestus can't escape, but it must have fled deeper into the facility. I'll drive it back here. I'll get the oh, cracked baby. core fixed in the meantime. Well. Keep her safe. Keep her safe, Varl. Oh boy. It's a scuffed. Oh god! Oh man, that was. 
almost bad. Imagine being Varl and Beta and just watching Aloy plunge to her death there on like by accident. Oh my gosh. I gotta chase after Hephaestus. Force it out of wherever it's hiding. Make it retreat to the core. Okay, cool. Thanks, dude. Appreciate that. Uh, let's go like this. Aloy, I've patched it to your focus feet. You should know there is a huge power draw coming from the next chamber. Thanks for the heads up. I'm almost there. Everything I've ever learned to do in a cauldron, I'm gonna have to do here, I'm sure. Some kind of production chamber. Festus is up to something, all right. What, what kind of machine is it trying to build? I don't know, but I'm gonna shut it down. I bet those metal carriers will lead me to where it's getting materials from. I bet that's where Festus is hiding, too. Dude, if Hephaestus is capable of just like straight up making new machines whenever it wants to, I wonder if there's like, if it's made any machines in reaction to the fact that Aloy seems to be able to take out all of its machines. I gotta find where Hephaestus is hiding. Looks like there are a couple of ways I could go. Well, like the slaughter good. spine, for example, doesn't I'm seem to sure have any utility. The components in the core, but the energy processor's cracked. Without a way to fabricate another, there's no way I can fix it. Okay, um, let me think. What if you bypass the processor, connect it to the power node? I think that could work. I think it could. Nice.
got them all. I, I tapped into the core's network hub. I managed to disrupt the Vestis' control of the node. You should be able to override it now. Nice. Thanks. Good thing Beta came. comfortable. Maybe a ligament from one of the machine carcasses? Right. Or, or some luminous braiding. And you could reinforce it with a conversion cylinder. For increased connectivity! Alright. Just this out of here. There should be another way to it. Got it. Alright. Man, Aloy is killing it, answering all these. Tech, quest, tech support questions while actively figuring out the call. Okay, well, covered in Come on. Oh. One of every machine. Just one of every. Out of place to hide. Uh, Aloy, I just registered a huge energy surge back in the production chamber. Something big is happening. Here too. Everything's glowing. The machine of Festus was building. It must have finished it. Oh, good. Oh, it's, it's powerful. Can't wait I'm to find out. I'm almost done with the core repairs. Should. Should we come to you? Maybe I could distract the machine if... No, thank Just stay where you are, okay? Handling the machine's my job. Be safe. What will it be? Oh, it's a slaughter. Those things on its legs are glowing. I think it's charging up. Good thing we fought a couple of these already. Man, if this was the first time you came across it. You got 
plasma on me. It's gonna explode any second. Okay, well, what do you want me to do? Stop, drop, and roll, anyway? Yeah, like if I hadn't already killed a bunch of these, this would be ridiculous. Festus back to you. So is this part of the four and a half hours or uh No more hiding, Hephaestus! Got it! Hephaestus is back in the core! Make sure it stays there. I'm heading back. And then we can start the merge. Because of you, Veda. I'm glad you came along. And you, Varl. We couldn't have done any of this without you. Right back at you, Aloy. Look at us getting all sentimental here. Something tells me something very bad's about to happen. Aloy just starts to get used to help, getting people to help her. And now, she's gonna wish she did it alone because some bad shit's gonna happen. I'm calling it. Aloy, the Akora stable. Hephaestus is 100% contained. Now we better get started with the merge. It's all set up. Gaia, establish the link, please. Done. To complete the merge, we need to excise Hephaestus' malicious code. Carefully. It's like driving a pirate ship. This is our life for four and a half hours. Come on, baby. Aloy, look. Uh oh. Cost us quite a lot of time. Of course, this was going to happen. Eric, get beta. And squash that bug while you're at it. Not gonna end well. 
Yeah. Man. Come on! Quit screwing around. Now we're having fun, right? No! <laughs> You promised, Aloy. <laughs> Finally. Tilda, get Gaia and Hephaestus ready for transport. Tilda! I failed. Hush. All is not lost. Tilda! Are you about to help us out? Hell yeah! No, I can't even see her! Oh, Tilda coming in clutch. Zenith. You must be Tilda. I wasn't sure if Beta would have told you about me. Where is she? Alive. And while she isn't where she wants to be, not in urgent danger. We must discuss how to get her back, of course, after you've shaken off the cobwebs. When you're ready, take the stairs down the hall and, and come see me. In the meantime, I'll make breakfast. Breakfast? Where is Varl? He's got to be dead. Or is he going to limp out? I would love it. Why did Tilda bring me here? all this for some kind of survival bunker I would like to remind chat in moments like these where we have a lot of main plot line stuff going on please do not spoil stuff in chat it can be easy to inadvertently spoil stuff. This? I'm not looking at chat right just now just because I don't want. Just a few favorites from my collection. Rescued and stored here just before I went off world. Take a look, if you like. I'm curious to hear your impressions. My friend is dead. Oh, he is dead. Okay. Beta and Gaia are gone, and you want me to look at old paintings? Don't be so quick to dismiss the comfort we can find in art. Or the insight we might gain. Ah, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm kind of with Aloy on this. That seems a bit weird. She didn't take our focus away. I would love to have confirmation on Varl's status. Although she didn't say Varl's not dead, so that's really freaking sucks if he's dead. I'm not saying this to bitch. I'm just saying this because it's just, it's, it's so cliche. 
the writing was on the wall on that from a mile away. Like the way that she's like, I appreciate you, Beta. I appreciate you, Varl. Thanks for coming with me. Here's my full character development, my full realization that I need the assistance of others. And now they're going to, now Varl's going to die. Like, it's just like, I mean, that kind of stuff is so played out in media. Like, it's... <laughs> God. Honestly, I think it would have it would it'd be in some ways more interesting if Varl died before that realization and then Aloy has the realization. I mean there's there's I don't know. I, I'm not again, I'm that's being nitpicky, but it's like I could see it coming from a mile away that something bad was gonna happen. Which is fine, because bad shit should happen in games. I don't like when everything works out, but that was very cliche. Alright. I'll look at your art, you out of touch person. My favorite pairing on the left is woman reading a letter by Vermeer, a true master. And on the right is a forgery, woman reading music, which fooled experts into believing it was a priceless original. Early in my career, I became fascinated with such deceptions. Eventually, I developed scanning software that could detect fakes with unparalleled accuracy. Is that how you made enough money to buy your way onto the Odyssey? Oh, no. I made my real fortune later. Selene and Endymion. She's the goddess of the moon, whereas he's a simple shepherd. Beside her is the god of love, Cupid. So she's sneaking up on him? More like visiting him in secret. The torch that Cupid bears represents Selene's undying infatuation with him. Though the two must remain apart, her love will forever burn. This is Rembrandt painting Jeremiah, a man in mourning. Mourning what? His home. The ancient city of Jerusalem. He foresaw its impending doom, but could do nothing to prevent it. So instead, he saved its treasures from destruction, just as I saved these works. You could say we're kindred spirits. Could you? Okay. portrait of the painter, Rembrandt's son, Titus, depicted in the habit of a monk. I don't get it. Why would someone like you, with infinite resources, care about this painting of a boy in a hood? It's not the image itself, but the feeling it conveys. The face is bright and defined, but his eyes are downcast, heavy with misfortune. And the background seems to swallow all light. The painting is infused with a sense of loss. I guess I understand how the painter feels. Uh, I'm. I've said this back when we played Red Dead, and I'm gonna, because there's a moment that's kind of like this, and uh, I'm gonna say it now. There is no such thing as art that is better than other art. Art is simply creative expression. It is something that is created by somebody for whatever level of consumption from the masses there may be. And to whatever degree that it is collectively deemed tasteful it is really irrelevant to the piece itself. So I am so disinterested in conversations about whether people have good or poor taste in art 
I am so disinterested in whether we look at something like this and say, is it good or is it bad? That is not how art works. Uh, you can learn so much about people from how they discuss their interests and their aesthetic tastes. Why do you like a thing that you like? Even if I personally do not appreciate the aesthetic of something, another person appreciating that aesthetic says something about them, and there are reasons why they may enjoy that. For example, listening to her talk about this painting of like how she is fascinated by the contrast in the face and the way that it evokes a certain emotion from her and that there's some mystery in why it evokes that emotion from her. There's a real richness to that. There's a real self-reflection that can come from looking at art and asking yourself what comes up for me when I look at it. And if the answer is nothing, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you you have to love and appreciate every piece of art that you ever come across. But we have this real tendency to like look at art in this evaluative way of whether it has achieved some level of like technical excellence. Uh, and that's just not what it's about. Uh, it's really cool to see what certain people create, what certain people appreciate, what they don't appreciate, all that kind of stuff. So, um, there's a reason that this person has all of these pieces of art in this gallery. And that, to me, is more interesting than the art itself. Like the inter interpersonal nature of how we like discuss and interpret and, and perceive art is far more interesting oftentimes than the colors that are on the canvas itself. So, uh, you know, art is reflective of not just the people that create it, but also the time periods that it's created in. There are time periods in which hyper-realistic paintings were valued by the masses because it was really the only way that you could get any representation of something since photography wasn't a thing. As photography becomes a thing, then we can get a little bit more abstract. But it's cool to see how art reflects movements in sociology, in the general like populace, in different cultures, how different art... like. You know, the Banuk, for example, when we were playing Zero Dawn, you see the Banuk use all these colors in particular ways. We see the Tanakh use colors on the body with different shapes, and it represents different things. And so we all have our different aesthetic tastes. So there are a few things less interesting to me than when people are presented with art and we go in the direction of, like, is it good and is it in good taste? It's, it's lame surface-level shit. Like, we're learning about this, a great deal about this person by the way she's talking us through her art and why she has collected it in the way that she has. And even though contextually it's a bit odd given the fact that we just lost Varl and we don't know where Beta is and shit's completely foobar, from a learning about another human standpoint, there's a lot here. And I love it. Rembrandt's The Night Watch, by far the most famous painting my homeland ever produced. It was commissioned to honor a militia made up of influential citizens. I guess you must have been an influential citizen. In my day. But not as influential as you've been in this new world. A lot of Rembrandts in here. Right, so one of the other things that we're seeing is like a connection to art that came from her homeland, which is very cool. The Gust by Willem van de Velde, the most famous of his many maritime paintings. A ship crossing into the unknown. I guess you're familiar with that. Indeed, uh -huh. which is why I appreciate this composition in particular. Though waves and wind threaten to destroy the ship, it perseveres, clinging to the light even as darkness closes in all around it. Stunning, isn't it? Paintings weren't the only masterpieces of my people's golden age. 
This is Von Vian insulated ewer. Molded from a single sheet of silver. What was it for? How like Elizabeth you are. <laughs> Function over form. Its practical purpose was less important than its meaning. Von Vianen created it in honor of his late brother, who himself was a famous silversmith. A memorial? Yes. Such beauty from sorrow. A lot of weight on his shoulders. Look at Aloy! Look at Aloy connecting with some of this art. Ah! Ah! Evokes a bit of self-reflection. How am I feeling? Like, oh, there's a lot of weight on my shoulders. She's pulling out her own hair. Out of madness? Out of grief? It's hard to watch her suffer. It's honestly pretty cool. It's the context of it's very weird, but... Done so soon. I've got more important things to worry about. We both do. There is much we are trying to save. Not the least of which is in that vault. There's nothing wrong with savoring such treasures for a moment more. Or come upstairs and we'll get down to business. Your choice. I looked at everything. You didn't have shit to say about these. What the hell? Look at my art longer, God. Oh. Maybe. Yeah, what the hell? I looked at everything. You don't have shit to say about these statues. Yeah, I'm coming upstairs. I'm... Appreciate my art collection. Come on. How did you find us at the cauldron? And what did you do to everyone right before I passed out? All business, I see. Well, suffice it to say we were keeping a very close eye on Hephaestus, knowing we would need it at some point. Your ruse didn't fool us, and as for my little trick, it was an overload of the senses, accompanied by an energy discharge. Gerard and Eric were only momentarily disoriented due to their shields, but it... it rendered you unconscious while I got you out. Perhaps some breakfast might steady you a bit? Oh, boy. Okay. Um... Oh, God. Uh, well. This is one of those moments where we got to take a second and we have to think about this moment and the way that it is constructed with um, context. I think it's pretty obvious and easy to take the same position as Aloy here. I mean, like, e Aloy's very easy to empathize with. It's like, I just watched Varl die. I watched Beta get taken by your compadres. I was blinded by a flash of light. I woke up in a random-ass facility, and one of the people who is connected to the people who just perpetuated all that nonsense is all of a sudden talking to me like somehow we have a bunch of shit in common. 
I don't trust you. And I am skeptical of your entire presence and who you are. I, that is completely understandable. I don't, I don't think Tilda is entitled to any kind of benefit of the doubt from Aloy at all. Uh, because Aloy's got to keep herself safe here. I mean, you'll notice that Tilda's shield is still up, which means that she's, you know, uh, anticipating maybe that Aloy's going to attack her. She's not entirely willing to be fully vulnerable. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here that really creates a lot of tension. However, in the interest of what we do here at Game Sessions with a Therapist, I do want to take a second and try to appreciate where Tilda's coming from. Because if we take her context into account, a context that has been uh, probably reinforced over thousands, well, hundreds of years at this point, introducing a person to fine art and inviting them to a lovely white cloth breakfast on a, a, a chateau, if you will, is how you would connect with some of the higher profile people of her day. Like, check out these nice digs. Check out the fine art that I collect. Let's talk about the top of the pyramid of needs here. Let's have a lovely, lovely brunch of croissants and uh, fruits. And let's get all dainty. This may be really the only way that this woman knows how to connect at this point because the people she's been around for so long are people that appreciate these things. And so she made mention that Aloy has more of an impact on the world around her than she ever did in the world that she came from, which suggests if we take her at her word on that, suggests a level of respect for Aloy, maybe even admiration. And so this could very well be an actual good faith effort to try to connect with Aloy and extend an olive branch here and show that she is not threatening because she's attempting to connect in the ways that she knows how. For us, it may feel a bit hoity-toity and out of touch because arguably it is. But for her, it may not be. For her, this could be a perfectly reasonable way to try to comfort Aloy through all sorts of unknowns and grief that she's been going through. I don't know the answer to that. But if we go in a direction of trying to empathize and give her the benefit of the doubt, uh, that may be what's going on here. Sometimes, so if we take the game context out of this and we talk about this just from like a real life interpersonal uh, like moment or dynamic that can happen, these types of things happen all the time. People have a tendency to reach out to others in a way that they themselves would feel connected, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to reach the person they're trying to connect to. Uh, we often try to connect with other humans inductively. And something that I try to teach in all these playthroughs is that's why it's so important to try to understand the context that other people come from because it can help you appreciate the ways in which they feel connected or understood. And you can be a bit more adept at the ways that you connect with the people around you if you're willing to pay attention to that type of thing. So, that's my point. This was your house. The one you recreated for Beta in the data channel you shared. How perceptive of you. Please, this way. After everything your people have done, you think I'm just gonna sit down? And have a chat with you? They're not my people. They never were, and especially not now. You shot off into space with them. And live with them for a thousand years before coming back. So what made you suddenly turn on them? Well, okay. Uh, I, uh, oh boy. Um... God, this is so hard because I don't know that we can fully trust this person, but um, man, if we go the benefit of the doubt direction again, I don't know that Aloy has a right to say that because Aloy is being uh, quite presumptive about Tilda here. She ostensibly could have said the exact same thing about Beta if Beta didn't look like her. I think the only reason she gave Beta the benefit of the doubt is because she was her. 
Uh, we don't know the circumstances by which Tilda got thrown onto Odyssey. We don't know what the deal was. Maybe it's been miserable for her. You'll notice that the women we've come across from Far Zenith seem to be not pro Far Zenith. It seems to be the men that are the douchebags of the Far Zenith so far. So, uh, I mean, we don't know that it's all hunky-dory on the Odyssey. It very well may have been an absolute nightmare that got overrun in certain ways and turned into something that nobody anticipated it was going to turn into, and Beta and Tilda are working hard to try to counteract it. I mean, there could be, we don't know anything about the context. So, I think Aloy going ham on that assumption is a bit of a miscalculation because we, we're we here. We might as well hear what she has to say. We can hear it with skepticism. We would hope that she has enough awareness of this context to know that Aloy is going to be skeptical of this and perhaps try to reach her a little bit better by acknowledging that. But... It's a bit of a reach there. We don't know anything about this person's context and why she turned on them. And the fact that she turned on them, it's sort of weird to be like hard on her about that. Like you, t like because turning on them theoretically is something that we would want to have happen. So we got to approach this with curiosity if we can. Very hard to do it, but uh, I, I mean, this is not easy. Quite simply, this. My old focus. You repaired it? But that means you've seen incredible things. What you've accomplished in two decades of life. Oh, wow. A thousand years at my back and I haven't even come close. That's a vulnerable ass thing. I needed your privacy, but I had to. In order to understand, to be enlightened. You truly are Elizabeth's blood. With her drive, her sense of mission, her integrity. Watching all this shamed me for the company that I've kept. Having seen it, all I want is to help you. Even if it means stopping your friends? Especially so. Please, sit down. Take the meeting, Aloy. Take the meeting. Yes. Thank you. Good. You can remain skeptical. Take the meeting. Now, Aloy's in a massive one-down position here. But here's the deal, and here's why I appreciate this. Tilda didn't have to show Aloy that. Tilda could sit in this meeting knowing everything there is to know about Aloy and not have told her that she knows everything there is to know about Aloy. And that would be a malicious exercise of the power she has of having so much information over her. She still holds a lot of power by having that information, but she did neutralize a considerable amount of it by telling Aloy that she has that info. Showing her that focus and telling her that she invaded her privacy and knows everything about her means that Aloy is a lot more informed about the dynamic that is present here, which to me facilitates some degree of trust doesn't have to mean that Aloy unconditionally hears what Tilda has to say here, but that was a move to neutralize the power imbalance that existed without Aloy's knowledge. I hope that makes sense as I'm saying this. She didn't have to give her that information, but she did. So we can sit at this table, hear what she has to say, and be skeptical about all of it. We don't have to trust it. We don't have to trust what Tilda says. I also don't think it behooves Aloy to sit here and just entirely dismiss everything Tilda has to say because of the fact that Tilda seems to be making certain moves that are designed to hold space for the weirdness of this entire thing. 
and try to neutralize some level of imbalance that comes along with just coming from entirely different contexts. This is really fascinating stuff. There. That's better. One more warning for chat. Please do not discuss any information that we have not already come across. It counts as a spoiler if you do that. If you are not sure whether something you are discussing is possibly a spoiler, you should assume that it is and stop typing. Now, we must recover Beta and Gaia at all costs. By now, you must know that Gerard intends to use Gaia to reboot the Earth's biosphere. Remaking this world to specifications that would only suit us immortals. This process will kill every living thing on the planet. He calls it a clean install. Not if I stop him first. Not if we do. And once he and the others are gone, we can work together to fulfill Elizabeth's dream. I'm sure Beta told you that there's a build of the Apollo database on board our ship. Nope! A complete collection of human knowledge. With that and Gaia, we could do everything Elizabeth wanted. Oh, what a, oh man, oh man, oh baby. <laughs> okay, uh, Apollo existing aside, I don't really care about that. That's cool, whatever, fine. Uh, Aloy's reaction here, that's where the juice is. That's where the juice is. Aloy didn't react, which is a beautiful move. Beautiful move. Because if Aloy gets giddy or excited or has a really strong reaction to that statement, she gives away a whole bunch of information to Tilda. So Aloy keeping a poker face. That, that's a freaking bomb drop, dude. Tilda saying that there's Apollo aboard the Odyssey is nuts. That is a spicy meatball. And Aloy's just like, she's like I'm sure Beta told you. Well, Aloy doesn't confirm or deny that. She just kind of looks at her like, go on. Which is really good because it leaves Tilda to have to make an inference about where uh, Aloy's coming from. Which means Aloy is actively now, again, trying to neutralize a power imbalance between the two of them. By making Tilda have to work with her assumptions rather than the reality of where Aloy is coming from. I'm not saying that it's necessarily the case that, like, um, you know, Aloy has to, like, that it's dangerous necessarily for Aloy to know this or whatever, but I do not recall Beta telling us that Apollo was aboard the, the Odyssey. I, that would be a thing I would remember. So, in this playthrough... I don't recall hearing that. If somebody in the comments wants to tell me what episode it happened in, I don't remember. But uh, that's pretty wild. I don't remember hearing that. Heal the biosphere. Educate the people of this world. Uplift them. Create. Them. It's still a good idea that that whether, whether they did or not, whatever. Ba this is why I say that that's the least interesting part of this. The interesting part of it is the fact that Aloy didn't give her anything. That's more important. World she imagined. <clears throat> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. From what I've seen, your friends are invincible. I do wish you would stop calling them my friends. And they're not invincible. In fact, a friend of yours has found a way to defeat them. Silence. Oh, he's been a busy bee, building an army powerful enough to crash through Gerard's precious base. Nice. Uh, really quick, Only I'm only saying this so I stop thinking about it. Is this the same voice actress that played Tess in The Last of Us? Because she sounds a lot like her. Like, I keep trying to pin where I've heard her voice before. It sounds very familiar. Is 
She's, it's Trinity from The Matrix? Oh, I've never seen The Matrix, so. Yeah. Regala and her rebels. Even now she's preparing a final march on the Tanakh the capital. When she wins, she'll have the entire tribe under her control. Hundreds of warriors and machines to throw at the base. She's been duped. They'll all perish, of course. But it should be enough to break Gerard's defenses and allow Silence to kill him. Oh! Along with all the others. Using the new weapon he's developed. Yes, he's found a way to circumvent our shields. Truly an exceptional man. He's planned for everything. Except you and me. You see, while his army is battering down Gerard's doors, you and I will sneak in through a back way. One that only I know about. While Silence and my friends are busy battling each other, we'll take back Beta and Gaia. I told you I want to help you. I mean it. <laughs> this is great. This is great. Holy shit. I do want to know her motivations. So hopefully we're going to get more information about this. Um, she's lived for a very long time. Let's see. Let's listen to her. I don't want to even hypothesize what it is. Let's just listen to what she has to say. So you knew Elizabeth. What was she like? Liz was everything she was. I see in you and more. Your ingenuity, your determination, your moral compass. You've managed to distill her greatest qualities and make them your own. I'm not asking about me. Tell me about Elizabeth. What was she really like? The honest answer is that I don't actually know. For all the time that I spent with her, she always kept a part of herself locked away. It was like that from the moment we met. Go on. So when you met Elizabeth, she was what? Distant? Aloof? Not aloof. Not exactly. It was a summit in Paris about machine learning, a touchy subject in those days, because regulatory authorities were just starting to clamp down on AIs. Liz gave the keynote address. She had already achieved great renown for her work in automated environmental reclamation, but in her address, she was just starting to imagine the next step, an AI-driven system that wouldn't just act on its programming, but actually take responsibility for its sphere of influence. To care about life, not just follow orders. Revolutionary stuff. I was fascinated. And I wanted to meet her for a long time. I watched her after her talk. She had spoken with such moral authority, such empathy. But after that, she retreated. I could tell she felt uncomfortable with all of her admirers. It was as if giving the talk had cost her something. I didn't want to be a pest, so I planned my approach carefully. So how did you finally approach Elizabeth after her talk? I picked the right moment. The morning of the next day, right as she came back to the conference, she had just had her coffee. She was fresh, rested. It was like she had braced herself for the onslaught of colleagues. I asked if I could walk with her, then put forth a question about her talk that I thought was intelligent. Her answer made me realize it wasn't, but she was very welcoming, almost as if we were previously acquainted. It was only halfway through the conversation that I realized she knew exactly who I was. It was quite a shock to me. 
My business was trafficking in secrets, and I took great pains to protect my anonymity. So that was Liz, perpetually one step ahead. I came to view our meeting as a metaphor for our friendship. She always seemed to know me far better than I knew her. I guess I know the feeling. Yeah. Hard to let people in. Aloy has certainly shown that. I appreciate... You know, again, one I we talked about this in the last episode, but one of the things I appreciate about the answer there from Tilda is that Tilda answered that question by talking in a lot of ways about her experience of Elizabeth. And instead of making hypotheses about Elizabeth, she just talks about what it was like to be around her and what the nature of it was like for her. And again, there's just so much more of a richness there. It's very cool. The only way we'd really know much about Elizabeth would be to get that well-rounded view from multiple people, but would be to talk to Elizabeth herself. And since we can't do that, hearing other people's experiences allows us to know the impact she had on people. We can sort of make inferences about her from there. It's pretty cool. You said Beta is not in urgent danger. So what are the Zeniths doing to her? Putting her to work. Merging Hephaestus with Gaia. A difficult, time-consuming task, as I'm sure you know. They will compel her if need be. But her life is not in danger. She's the only one who can do it. Because you people made her to be nothing but a tool. Gerard's idea, not mine. They always viewed me with suspicion when I attempted any form of kindness towards her. That's why I created the Data Channel, a virtual place where we could speak in peace. So this channel you shared with Beta, none of the other Zeniths ever found out about it. Gerard believes he's the most cunning of all of us. Even after a thousand years, he still can't imagine that I would outwit him. The channel allowed me to interact with Beta away from their mistrustful eyes. It offered us a chance to be ourselves. Until you cut off all contact. Yes. Though it pained me. I was worried that our meetings would do her more harm than good. Well, she felt like you tossed her aside. I was afraid the others would find out and punish her. She may not have had the comforts of friendship anymore, but at least I ensured she was safe. I know it seems harsh, but you must believe that her well-being has always been paramount to me. Oh, God. Well, oh, man. Um, the amount of times I have heard parents make bad interpersonal decisions with their children because they believed it was in their best interest to do so is wild. Um, I, oh, there's, there's so much, oh, there's so much complexity to this. So I'm trying to figure out the way I don't want to talk about this without taking the next 45 minutes to talk about it. Um, depending on the age that Beta was when that happened, and I don't know exactly what that age would have been, but let's make the assumption that it's like relatively recently, so like late teens, early adulthood. At some point, and Tilda's as much of a parent figure to Beta as there is, apparently. So we're going to talk about this from like a parent-child standpoint. Um, at some point, as a parent, it is deeply important that you acknowledge the autonomy 
of your child and their ability to make decisions based on variables that are in like their purview. So rather than going in the direction that Tilda went, which would be to essentially cut off contact, leaving Beta in the lurch, wondering why, and leading her to her own inductive suspicions about why that might have been. If Tilda wanted to facilitate some of Beta's emerging autonomy, which I understand could be dangerous for, for Beta, but again, we're going to talk about this more in real life circumstances here. You give your child the information which is to say something along the lines of, hey, so I really love that we are having these conversations or that we're doing this thing, but doing this thing, Beta, puts you in danger. I am worried that the other Zeniths are going to find out about these meetings and that if they find out about these meetings and your growing sense of autonomy and the fact that you have this kind of relationship with me, I am worried that you could be uh, punished for that. Hell, maybe I could be punished for it, but I'm worried about the impact that this might have on you. But I realize that if I end this, uh, or that if we choose to end this, that that's going to have its own set of consequences as well. I don't know for sure whether the other Zeniths are going to find out about these meetings. So I would like to have a conversation with you about whether this is something that we should continue to do. Be, are you, are, do you understand the risks if we continue to do this? And now if Tilda is at a point where she's like, hey, I can't afford the risk on this because I could get in deep trouble on this. Well, then it's important for her to say that to Beta as well. Like, hey, I, look, I'm really thinking that we got to stop doing this because I could be in huge trouble. You and I both could be in danger. Like, that could be a variable she brings to it. But have the conversation with Beta. Give Beta the opportunity to be in control of something that she's been actively engaging in for quite some time or to have some sense of joint control over it. There are so many parents that as their children get old enough to be able to do that will not do that with their children and will make judgment calls and decisions on behalf of their children because they believe they know better that actively disrupts a child's sense of autonomy and may often lead to a child being angry or resentful toward them, particularly as they get older, where your children will start to exercise cognitive autonomy in the direction of screw my parents they don't believe in me and they don't give me opportunities to solve my problems. They just make them for me. Why would I trust them? So you got to be really careful with that kind of thing. You know, I, when you have young children, yeah, you make, you make hard decisions for your kids. You do your best. You try to keep them safe. But you have got, it, it's harder for parents to acknowledge the development of their children than we often talk about and that difficulty acknowledging that autonomy can lead to some bad decisions kind of like what tilda did like tilda is justifying her actions on harming beta emotionally by saying well at least i kept her safe but then you're presented with a real conundrum of is being safe a good enough context to be lonely in like, would I rather feel connected to somebody and like there's a meaningful relationship in my life and be potentially in danger? Or would I rather be in isolation, emotionally cut off, but like alive and safe? That's, whew. I mean, that's a hard decision to make, but it's one that Beta should is old enough to be able to participate in. Very complicated stuff. But yeah, when Beta said basically put it... I mean, we saw Aloy struggle, by the way. Aloy struggling to pull that arrow. It wasn't to shoot the far zenith. It was to shoot Beta. I, I, hope, I hope all of you picked up on that. Like, Aloy had a moment where she thought about putting an arrow through Beta's skull. Because that's what she told Beta she would do.
So we already know a bit about where Beta is with this. I don't want to be around these people. I would rather not have my life than be alive and safe and around people who use me in the way that they use them. So Tilda then becomes party to that. And in some ways, Aloy became party to that because they had a conversation about that. They shook on it, man. Now, I don't know that it... but it, so And so now... It, 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 this is the beauty of this thing. Like, this is what I, I love. I love the just insane amount of layers on this. So now, if you're if you're saying to yourself, but Dr. Mick, if Aloy shot Beta there, and Beta's the only person that can merge Hephaestus and Gaia, well, the, you can't shoot Beta then. You need Beta in order to merge Hephaestus and Gaia. Well, that doesn't make us any better than the Zeniths. Because process-wise, that's us doing the exact same thing. That's us keeping Beta alive in a circumstance that is absolutely antithetical to her well-being because we need her because of the utility she provides. Put an arrow through Beta's skull and kill her there, and we do the arguably consented to humane thing that Beta very much requested that we do. But then the fallout of that is, well, now we're going to have to figure some, but something else out in terms of merging Gaia and Hephaestus. Or maybe we got to wait the 35 hours or maybe we just like. That's the problem is we're also using beta. So there's a lot going on here, man. I, I know I just went in a bunch of different directions, but it's fascinating stuff here. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Why did you make the data channel look like this place? I built this house as a shelter to weather any storm. A safe place. Not just for me, but for the art stored below. Cultural artifacts of incalculable value. Truly, some of the greatest achievements of human civilization. And you wanted Beta to see them? Yes. Her upbringing was so cold and technical. I thought if she could experience Vermeer and Rembrandt, it would bring something else into her life. A heritage every bit as valuable as the scientific and technical data being drummed into her. I'm sorry I had to cut off contact, but I'll never regret sharing this house with her. She needed its shelter even more than I did. I can appreciate that. I really can. You know, like if Beta had the super myopic, myopic upbringing, I appreciate her desire to try to diversify that a bit while Beta's developing. That, that I think isn't a terrible thing. Is it reasonable to be unwilling to take someone's life even if you promised you would? Shouldn't make that promise if there's any doubt in your mind whether you can do it. Aloy, Aloy, the, the complexity of that is when Beta said, you know, do what you gotta do if I'm gonna be taken by them again. If Aloy has any shred of doubt, even a 1% shred of doubt that she would hesitate to pull the trigger on that, she should have told Beta that. She should have said, I don't know that I can promise I'll do that. I very well in that moment might hesitate to pull the trigger. Uh, if you can live with that, I mean, I feel pretty good about my the chances that I'll pull it, but I can't guarantee it. And then Beta gets to make a decision about what she wants to do as it relates to that. And that puts us right back in this same very complicated decision uh, or this, this complicated scenario. If Beta says, no, I want 100% guarantee that you're going to take my life if I get held by the Zeniths again, or else I'm not going, and we force Beta to go, again, are we any better than the people of Far Zenith? I would argue the answer to that is no. People of Far Zenith are trying to figure out how to survive and perpetuate themselves in the same way that we are. So Aloy should never have made that promise because what that tells us is that that was a promise that was made to pacify Beta in order to get her to be on board with doing the thing we wanted her to do, more so than it was a reflection of the reality of Aloy's willingness to actually pull the trigger. 
And I realize that Aloy can't necessarily fully anticipate what she's going to do in that moment. But again, you got to have enough self-reflection and awareness there to know that there's a possibility you're going to hesitate. And uh, Aloy, if we get reconnected with Beta, man, I, I, that was a big, big misstep. No, Beta may come back and say, you know, I'm kind of glad you didn't pull the trigger because this is going to work out. Maybe she will. But if, if Beta comes back and says, you're an asshole and I'm never going to trust you again because I trusted you with the most vulnerable thing I could possibly think of and you failed me, I would say, yeah, that checks out. So is overpromising bad? Yeah. You should be realistic with what you say you will do. If you're not sure whether you can do something, you should acknowledge that you're not sure whether you can do it. You should be honest. Overpromising and underdelivering, uh, particularly on very vulnerable things. I'm not talking about like, I'll be at the party at 8 and you show up at 8.15. That's not the kind of shit we're talking about. I'm talking about real vulnerable shit. That is literally, Beta's worst nightmare is being back in the hands of the Far Zenith. That is the That is her worst nightmare. Her request to Aloy to end that is not something to be taken lightly. So overpromising on something like that, terrible. Overpromising on like, yeah, I'll bring every variety of Dorito to the party and then you you know miss a couple of them. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. Beta told me your colony was destroyed. That you came back to Earth because you had nowhere else to go. It's true. After we reached our destination, a planet in the Sirius star system, we spent decades building a new home. The physical constraints of Earth, the boundaries of mortality, gone. To think of what we could have done with it. It might have been a utopia. But? Instead, we stagnated, absorbed in effortless comforts and virtual realities. It took a cataclysm to finally yank us out of our stupor. What happened? A massive geological event. We knew of instabilities in the planet core, but we underestimated them. By the time the collapse was upon us, it was too late to stop it. Only a few of us made it to the ship in time. We set course for Earth, the only safe harbor left to us. Which you decided to make unsafe for anyone else. Not me. Gerard. He believes it's better to wipe the canvas clean than work around the smudges. No more primitive tribes, no more combat machines, only a blank slate to do with as he pleases. But we will stop him. All we have to do is get into that base. What? So, I am not suggesting that this is an easy thing to do. I ask this question purely out of curiosity. If I am Aloy sitting here across the table from Tilda, my question is, why did you guys not mutiny? Or does everybody else seem to follow him? Or does he rule with an iron fist? She keeps deferring a lot of shit to Gerard. I need to know more about Gerard. Why is everybody following him? Why aren't people revolting? Why are you the only one that seems to dissent with what it is that he has to say? Are there any other rumblings of dissent across the other Farzinas that we can leverage? Like, what's going on here? Why does Gerard rule with an iron fist? What does he have that allows him to maintain power over all of these people? Because it's very hard for me to divorce you from the Farzinith directive unless you give me that information. Like, she's... She keeps deferring things to Gerard, but I'm not hearing information that makes it easier for me as Aloy to divorce her from Gerard. Because it's easy to see the Far Zenith all as complicit in this, because if you guys are this powerful and immortal and all this fun stuff, like, wh wh why, why is he the one that makes the call here? Do you guys have strength in numbers? Does he rule with an iron fist? Are there controls that he's put in that make it so that you could, like, die? Like, what is the nature of his power? I, I really need to know that. What exactly is your plan to sneak into the Zenith base? 
We will make use of a lesson I learned from an early age. Always know your exits. In this case, a place where Gerard's new construction meets the ancient foundation, a passage that only I can access. When Silence flings his army at the base, we will enter through this back door, bypassing most of the fighting. The distraction will provide us with a window in which to rescue Beta and Gaia. Once we're inside the base, where will we find Beta and Gaia? <coughs> Here, in the command center. By then, Gaia will have been reunited with all of its subordinate functions, including all? Hephaestus. What about the alpha build of Apollo on your ship? A simple matter of recovery, once the others have been dealt with. With that in hand, we'll have everything we need to make this world as it should be. And then what? What's your plan after that, O oh, ye immortal one? I would love to know that too. Like, what are you, again, what's your stake in this? I, I do want to know what her, what's driving her on this. How do you know about Silence's plan? He isn't the only one adept at spyware. You hacked his focus? No, he's too careful for that. But his subordinates? <laughs> Not so much. He gave additional focuses to the tribals he branded the sons of Prometheus. The ones working with Regala. By tapping their focuses, I learned about most of his dealings. The distribution of override technology, the arming of Tanakh rebels, and the secret pact with Regala to attack Gerard's base. But how did he come up with a weapon that can take down your shields? That's the one thing I haven't been able to figure out, but... However he did it, I'm quite certain it will work. With it and the Tanakh army, victory seems to be within his grasp. Such a shame he'll be disappointed. Hmm. Regala's only interested in killing Hakaro and waging war on the Karja. What does she have to gain by attacking Zenith? It's the price she must pay for her war. Without the ability to override machines, her little rebellion would have languished in the desert. So she trades with the sons of Prometheus. Machines to help her overthrow Hikaru. In exchange for an assault on the base. Pride has deluded her into thinking she can actually survive such a battle. And all without ever knowing who the sons of Prometheus really answer to. Yet, for all of Silence's brilliance, still he underestimates you. That blind spot is what will allow us to take Beta and Gaia right out from under him. While hundreds of Tanakh are cut down outside. Yeah, I mean, we, there, it is... We, we are a little out of touch with all the casualties here, the human casualties. Like, we're talking about the Tanakh like they're stormtroopers or something. Like, they, they, there's real loss of human life here, Tilda. Like, yeah, just send the Tanakh in droves. We'll sneak in the back. We're good. There is a bit of a coldness there. That I'm not a huge fan of. My old focus. How did you find it, let alone repair it? When we encountered you at the Hades Proving Lab, Gerard saw you as a redundancy. I knew better. You were a revelation. After your dramatic escape, bravo, by the way. Gerard and Eric assumed you were dead and gave up the hunt. I wasn't so sure. When the others were busy, I returned to the lab and searched for any trace of you. That's when I found this little treasure. Not easy to repair, but certainly worth the effort. As I watched your life unfold, you were like a splash of color on a worn canvas. What Liz was, and more. Did you show it to the others? Of course not. It was your actions that inspired me to defy them. It's worth noting that if I hadn't found it and watched its contents, I wouldn't have known to save you at the cauldron. You'd be dead. So I should be grateful? If you like. Hmm. 
just you know, you know, again, it's one of those things where I really do think it's partly indicative of her lack of understanding of Aloy's context and you and her using her own. One of the things that she's doing is she's trying to stroke my ego, which I really do think is the product of being stuck on a ship in a planet with a bunch of people who spent their lives having their ego stroked. So, like, she she's... She's trying to play Aloy up like, oh, you're everything Elizabeth was and more, even though I didn't really actually know Elizabeth that well. So my idealization of her comes from something that's not exactly rooted in reality. So it's really something I'm kind of making up in my head. So when I tell you that you're more than what Elizabeth was, it's not actually super authentic because it's not like it just it rings a bit hollow here because that's not what Aloy needs. She doesn't need her ego stroked. But Tilda is reaching, trying to reach her that way. And uh, I'm surprised by that a bit, given the fact that she watched all of Aloy's history through that focus and would know that that's not necessarily something that Aloy's going to connect with. So it's just kind of, it's like, ah. But comes from a context where I think she probably has to do that with everybody. It comes from a bunch of people who are so used to having their asses kissed that that's just how you get them, it's how you get them to eat lunch. So you know all about me. Mm. What about you? What would you like to know? Uh, it's so many things. Start with your life on Earth. When I was eight, terrorists flooded my home city. Thousands drowned, my parents included. I was one of the few who survived. My guardian sent me to boarding school. Among my peers, I was the strange girl, the orphan to be avoided. All because of circumstances beyond my control. Oh. So we're a lot alike, huh? Aren't we? You are an outcast. But you didn't let that stop you from getting what you needed. Neither did I. I climbed my way out of desolation and used my wits to build a fortune. First from the technical analysis of art and the detection of forgeries. Profitable expertise in those days. But as it turned out, the software I developed was even more useful for counterintelligence. From there, it was only a short step to gathering extremely valuable intelligence on my own. You were a spy? More like a service one could turn to for information. <laughs> I had to remain anonymous, of course, to protect my privacy. Of course, of course, and your safety. Despite that anonymity, Far Zenith inevitably sought me out. Oh man, I, I mean, look, she's the she's the product of a really shitty time in human history. Uh, really, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying this because I've, I'm, you know, all buddy buddy with Tilda here, but she is, she is the product of absolute nightmare bullshit time. Like, I, she, oh god, I mean, a lot of it really does ring pretty hollow here. Like, you're not me. I get that you're trying to connect with me in some way. You're trying to facilitate some intimacy. You're doing that in a lot of ways because you need me. Like, you used your skills to get into my focus and get information. You learned that there's power in having information. Like, that's very all very well and good, but we're not the same person. We're not exactly... Uh, we're not exactly going to see eye to eye on all these things. Like, Tilda comes from a very corporatized, technological, AI-advanced, militarized world. And you don't just divorce yourself from that. We also don't know what the last several hundred years have been like being with a bunch of billionaires on a spaceship and then another planet. So, you know, this is just a huge misfire here. We we have we have two different time periods in human history talking to each other right now. Like this would be like if we tried to go back and talk to cave people and we shared the language. We'd we'd miss the mark too. What happened when Farzinath approached you? 
They painted an irresistible vision of humanity's future. One where we need not fear illness or death, where we explored the furthest reaches of the stars and thrived. It was only later that I realized that they only intended to bequeath this future to the rich and powerful. By the time I finally figured it out, the walls were closing in, Faro's machines were devouring the Earth. So I accepted Farzenith's invitation to a birth on the Odyssey. I wanted Liz to come, but she had nobler plans, as you well know. I don't feel bad for you that you were... <laughs> Like, I don't feel bad for you that you became part of the Farzinas. Uh, I'm not going to not gonna get there. Like, she is in some ways trying to craft some degree of narrative where we feel compassion for a kind of a, like, a helplessness in this whole ordeal. Like, you're, you, you can't, you're not this big, powerful, and influential, and also helpless at the same time. You know, you, 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 it's fine. You chose to be part of Farzina. I, I don't feel bad for you. So you didn't know the other Zeniths were monsters until it was too late? I, I knew some of them were, certainly. It, it wasn't until we were off planet that I understood the true scope of their greed. I was grateful to simply be alive, but... The others became obsessed with a kind of effortless immortality. They built a colony where machines serviced their every need, where any memory or fantasy could be endlessly savored in virtual reality. It wasn't life. It was stultifying, a pampered dream state. As the decades passed, I withdrew more and more, alone yet again but this time with eons to consider my mistakes. Now, finally, having met you, I feel like I have a second chance. To do what? Help you, of course. To fulfill Liz's dream, which isn't so different from Farzina's original vision. A better future for humanity. Hmm. Yeah, one that... I mean, she does have some stake in that because she's going to live forever. So if you're immortal, yeah, I'd like to know that the longevity of humanity is going to be decent. But uh, I don't know. I'm not walking away from this conversation feeling super empowered and connected to her. Like, she hasn't, for somebody who read my entire history, she hasn't really done a great job finding ways to connect with me. Whether that's because of interpersonal deficits or because she's got ulterior motives, I, I do think I'm, I'm walking away from this conversation with still a bit of skepticism, maybe even cynicism. Like, that's cool, but mm, we got a long way to go before we're going to really feel connected interpersonally and I'm going to trust you. Uh, thank you for the 300 bits, Jedi. And for the kind words. First Faro. Now Hikaru and the Tanakh. Your plan would wipe out an entire tribe. There has to be another way. We are in an admittedly desperate situation, but I assure you there isn't. Remember Zero Dawn. Elizabeth's sacrifice. Sometimes many have to die for a new world to grow. Ugh. You're not wrong, but ugh. It's impossible. Look deeper. Wait. The data channel. It still exists, doesn't it? I need you to open it. Let me talk to Beta. Impossible. We might be detected. It's worth the risk. There is another way. One where the Tanakh survive. But we won't. Oh, no! You mean we gotta sacrifice hundreds of people instead of 
Two. Oh no. Self-preservation all of a sudden coming to the forefront. See, it's like it's really easy. You know, a lot of people will die, but that's a risk I'm willing to take. You know, it's like, well, unless you're going to throw yourself in the frying pan here, too, then we're at a bit of a non-starter. If the others, if you want to help, open it. Bitch. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Way to leverage your power there, Aloy. Oh, baby. Yes. Oh boy. Oh boy. Now. Aloy better not run the risk of believing that she is entitled to Beta being happy to see her. Because Aloy might think this is a big, nice, awesome, cool, super cool, sweet, ideal. But you better be ready to empathize with Beta's experience or this is going to miss the mark in a big way. And we'll find out what that's like right now. What are they doing to her? Virtual reality dissociation. The manual merge of Hephaestus will take hours upon hours of tedious micromanagement. If she resists the work, they run simulations to induce feelings of isolation and despair. Oh my God! Beta, can you hear me? That's just straight torture. That is, that is literally they are doing worse than waterboarding her. That is so horrifically bad. I have no way of quantifying it. That is literally the worst thing you could ever possibly do to a person emotionally. That is, they are just traumatizing her to the a level that is, oh boy, oh boy. Oh, man. You're alive. They're watching me. I, I, I can't hold up this extra projection for long. Oh, shit. Go. Get in you there. You should have killed me. No. No, look at me. I'm coming for you. I promise. Okay? I just need you to hold out a little while longer and work on the merch. Contact again when it's time. Can you hold on? As long as I know you're coming for me, I can endure anything. Well, that's quite the olive branch from Beta. All right. I did as you asked. Now I think you need to tell me what you're planning. I'm going to take Silent's army away. I don't need it. Only the weapon he made to penetrate your shields. And how do you propose to get it? Ask him nicely? Without Regala and her rebels, he won't have a choice. We'll be his only option. Only option for what? What did you tell her? That is between me and my sister. Will be Silent's only option for crashing that base. I'll tell you the rest later. But first, there are a couple of things I have to do. Oh. And what are those? Oh, look how pissy Tilda is when she's not in control. Oh. See, you know, things are all well and good. She's all miscompassionate, lovely, build you up, give you the whole shebang while she's in control. You take the control away from her, and all of a sudden, we start to see a little bit of what we're working with here. Lay my friend to rest. And then I'm going to use the override that Beta gave me at Gemini to 
put an end to Rakala's rebellion from the air. Wait. Since you insist on doing things your way, I know of something that will truly help you make a grand entrance with the Tanakh team. Good. Put your money where your mouth is. The ancient Horus Titans still possess electromagnetic energy cells as part of their arsenal. Drop one of those on Regala's army and they'll receive quite a surprise. So go, do what you must. I'll come to your base if you manage to bring silence to the table. Not if, when. Uh, 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 Tilda, quick question, quick, quick, quick question, question, clarification question, quick, uh, quick, 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 quick question. Uh, could you please clarify what it is we're dropping? Am I dropping a fat boy? Or am I dropping an EMP? Am I dropping, what am I dropping? Am I nuking Regala's forces? Or am I gassing them? Am I, am I turning off their electronics? What am I doing? I would, I would really love some, I'd love me some clarification, please, on what it is I'm going to be dropping from a Horus. <laughs> or, or is this a freaking Wonder Ball where we're just going to drop it and ooh, 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 what's in the Wonder Ball? Let's see. Yay, maybe some candy. Aaron, are you there? Aloy! Aloy, is that really you? Yeah, it's, it's me. Where's everyone else? We're all... At, we're, we're back at base. What happened? It... It might be easier to explain in person. I'll try to join you there when I can. Okay. I, we'll wait here for you. It's good to hear your voice, Aloy. Oh my lord. Okay, so we're over here. We're not far away from some of the... Oh, wow. We've sort of been, like, over here-ish. Tilda's Mansion. Oh, man. Uh, this is gonna be rough. Sterling Malkeet's YCITT Enigma. News item. All the markings of the next big thing, a much ballyhooed acquisition from an art historian turned technologist, no less, bleeding edge science, and a great narrative to boot. The application was called YCITT after Young Christ in the Temple, a well known Vermeer forgery. By creating perfect holographic scans of individual layers of a painting and comparing them to a vast library of artistic works, it was able to identify fakes with an unprecedented level of accuracy. But it was clear to Sterling executives that the program's ability to match and identify patterns had broad applications outside the art world. As a tool for security, counter-surveillance, or digital authentication, it could prove just as revolutionary as it had in its intended role. Which is why they were willing to sign a nine-figure agreement for it, blasting news of the deal to every outlet in the tech media. Two years later, the project collapsed in a chaotic jumble of lawsuits, recriminations, and accusations of sabotage. So what went wrong? Who was responsible? And most importantly, what happened to the underlying technology, which by all accounts was far more powerful than the vaporware label applied by disgraced executives data corrupted? Oh, baby. Everything goes military. Everything goes military and shit gets bad. Gotta love succumbing to human desire to beat the shit out of each other in the name of survival. Just to let you know, I'm now patched into your focus network. Great. I take it the other Zenus can't hear us? Of course not. And they don't know about your base either, in case you were wondering. I've sent you data on the Horus energy cells you can use against Regala's forces. Reach out to me when you're ready to acquire one. Understood. I do appreciate that she's telling me that. All right, Horus energy cells. Aloy, all Fast Boar 7 Horus combat platforms included EMP cells as part of their arsenals. There we go. Acquiring and deploying one shouldn't be difficult, but we'll get to that in a moment. 
the bigger issue is activation. Barring extraordinary circumstances, such as an interference from Hades, as you experienced last year, all Horus munitions are inert, deactivated, deactivated by Minerva's decryption regime during the 21st and 22nd centuries. To render these EMPs operational, we will have to skirt those efforts. I've devised a way to do so without causing unwanted repercussions, a bespoke code signal that should enable all and only such devices in the vicinity. I've transferred it to your focus. All you have to do now is send it out. A Zero Dawn communications relay should do the trick. I believe you refer to them as tall necks. I've chosen one for you that is centrally located, now marked on your HUD. Simply override it as you would normally, and my signal will automatically transmit. Every EMP on every Horus within a 500 kilometer radius should come online. On to acquisition and deployment. Horus units manufactured EMPs in their fabrication bays, then subsequently loaded them onto their multi-purpose appendages, or tentacles if you like. Because the cells were designed to be detachable, enabling them to be fired or thrown at enemy forces, their fittings should be quite light. The only way to attain them will be through air, but it sounds like you already have that covered. When you reach one, it should come loose with a handy yank, rust or corrosion notwithstanding. There's no need to prime the cell, as they're designed to trigger on impact. Once you have one, all you need to do is drop it in the target area. I'm sure Regala and her minions will enjoy the experience. All the best, Tilda. Mm, baby. Mm, baby. All right, so it's an EMP. I feel a little bit better now. If it was a nuke... I would have been questioned. We didn't finish our croissants. Not a fat boy. Yep, not a fat boy. We're not not dropping a fat boy on Regala. Retrospective, Rotterdam 2033. Data corrupted. Cyber attack by far-right anti-migrant group Purity Action Europe reversed key instructions to the city's new storm surge barriers, rendering them fully open during a massive extratropical cyclone. The resulting flood cascaded through the city in a matter of minutes, effectively wiping it from the face of the earth. I was one of the lucky ones, recalls survivor Til- oh. <laughs> I was one of the lucky ones, recalls survivor Tilda Vandermeer, who was eight at the time of the attack. My family was wealthy. We had a watertight vault for some of our most precious belongings. My father locked me inside when he went to look for my mother, so I waited there in silence as the waters rose, praying every moment that my parents would return. They never did. As horrible as that sounds, Tilda was very lucky indeed. In addition to her parents, the flood killed more than 100,000 people, including approximately 40,000 climate refugees from Data Corrupted. Well, lucky is, uh... L lucky's an interesting word to apply there. You know, at what point is survival of something like that worse than just, you know. Oh! This is the building that I was climbing on before where I had a hard time getting to the... Oh! We've been here. Oh, that's interesting that we actually already came through here. <laughs> How you doing, buddy boy? You doing okay? You know, okay, kitty man? You nice and comfy? That's good. Because my wrist hurts a lot trying to keep you up. All right. Good shit, man. Oh. Careful. Careful, Mufasa. Careful, Mufasa. Don't Mufasa yourself, buddy. All right, so. Little is known about Gerard, leader of the Far Zenith faction that returned to Earth. Eric's the primary enforcer. Big ol' Eric.
Look at that, we've got all the hologram data. Wow, we're doing decently well, except for the world data points. 69% done, friends. Nice. All right, so. Uh, we go back to the base of operations. Uh, and obviously what lies behind that door is going to be covered in part 43. Uh, friends, I appreciate you taking the time to watch through this part. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope my thoughts were meaningful in some way. It was quite the juicy episode here. It was a good one. I enjoyed it, Im I enjoyed it immensely. Um... Really just a well-crafted game. Please leave a thumbs up. Leave a comment if you'd like. Please remember to remain spoiler-free in the comments. I do appreciate those of you that are continuously adhering to the spoiler-free rules around here. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, Varl, may he rest in peace, apparently. It really sucks. Hate that he died. Uh, share this with people. If you think that they would like to watch the playthrough as well. Uh, if you are binging, I will see you over in the next episode. We'll be right here. If you're waiting for the next one to come out, I'll get it out as soon as I can. Come watch us live sometime. I'd love to have you. But I appreciate you immensely. I'll catch you on the next one.